spotlight shine them bright Gonna have a grand new show tonight With glitz and glam on the marquee Perhaps a Tony nominee Stars beam brightly, see them glow Sell out nicely, SRO It's time to applaud the Broadway beat Stars beam brightly, see them glow in the footlights of a show Life is sweet on the world's most famous street Tickets, please Take a seat Cue the band And tap your feet To the rhythm of the Broadway beat The Broadway beat Broadway beat Hello, I'm Richard Ridge and welcome to the kickoff of the 18th season of Broadway Beat where each week we bring you a behind-the-scenes look at the very best of what the New York Theatre has to offer. And we're thrilled you're here and have a lot in store for you, including a visit to Xanadu, the new musical which is packing them in at the Helen Hayes Theatre. We'll revisit with the cast, led by Kerry Butler, Cheyenne Jackson, and Tony Roberts. And as an added treat, we have the star of the film, the delightful Olivia Newton-John. We'll also drop by the Julia Miles Theater for a sneak peek at the 2007 New York Musical Theater Festival. But we thought we'd start things off by giving you a look at some of the shows that opened or transferred during this very busy summer season on the boards. Up first is TheaterWorks USA's new streamlined production of Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty's musical, Seussical, which is based on the works of Dr. Seuss. The original Broadway production of Seussical was not a success, but the creators have reworked it and TheaterWorks USA enjoyed an incredible run throughout July and August at the Lucille Lortel Theater, delighting thousands of young theatergoers with the story of Horton the Elephant and the Cat in the Hat. Steve Solomon's hit one-man comedy, My Mother's Italian, My Father's Jewish, and I'm in Therapy, has transferred to the West Side Theater, and along the way has picked up a new star. The new Steve is now Paul Kreppel, who is best remembered as the role of Sonny on the hit TV series, It's a Living. Oh, but the wildest thing would be when my Jewish grandmother would try to convince my Italian mother to keep kosher. Now, my mother... She couldn't make any sense or logic of the Jewish rules and restrictions. She knew something about, oh, not being able to eat meat and milk and that you couldn't eat pork and shellfish like clams, lobster and shrimp. But well, they would go at it for hours. And I would just sit there and listen and watch. My mother would usually start. All right, so let me get this straight. You can't have a meat and a milk together. It's a no kosher. That's right. It's not kosher. All right, so that means a veal parmesan is no good, meatball parmesan, no cheeseburger. You're starting to understand. Okay, but what, what about the chicken parmesan? No, that's not kosher either. Okay, how about the fish parmesan? No, that's okay, that's kosher. Okay, so shrimp parmesan is, is kosher. No, according to Jewish law, shrimp's not a fish. Oh, my gosh, what are you trying to make me crazy with this idea? <laughs> All right, let's go back to the chicken. Chicken and a cheese is no kosher. I already told you. All right, but what about the egg and cheese? Now, egg and cheese is okay. That's kosher. <laughs> All right, so let me get this straight. If I have an egg in this hand, a piece of cheese in this hand, it's kosher until the egg hatches and then it's a no kosher. 
You finally understand. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Everywhere you go, there is a Walmart store. So, have they taken over the world? Well, the new off-Broadway musical, Walmartopia, which is currently playing at the Minetta Lane Theater, thinks they have. This politically satirical new musical is written by Catherine Capillaro and Andrew Ron. Walmartopia tells the timely tale of Vicki Luttrell, a single mom and Walmart employee who speaks out against her company's working conditions and finds herself and her daughter jetsoned to 2036 into a future where Walmart dominates the entire world. Mama, you know I'm not a baby anymore. When I look at the open sky, I know I've got to fly. Price like Paul Bunyan From Doritos to Funyuns Come, Come and taste our milk and honey Durst is one of the nation's leading political satirists, and he's brought his new one-man show, entitled The All-American Sport of Bipartisan Bashing, to the New World Stages. Here's Will Durst. I don't even have to write material. I wrote these down. I don't want anybody to think that I'm paraphrasing. These are verbatim quotes from our president, number 43, W. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They will stop at nothing to harm America. And neither will we. <laughs> he said that and he meant it, ladies and gentlemen. He also said, I think we can all agree the past is over. <laughs> Demonstrating his grip on our economic tiller, more and more of our imports are coming from overseas. I give him his due, and he's right, he's right, right? <laughs> this is my favorite. The problem with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> and bless your hearts for laughing at that joke. You don't know how many audience will stare at me like I'm trying to teach a dog chess, you know. <laughs> oh? When in Rome, do as the Romanians do. <laughs> I have no idea what the Romanians do in Rome. He said this in New Orleans. He said, we're going to rebuild these levees to equal or greater strength. 
Now, I'm no engineer. But I'm thinking greater might be gooder. <laughs> that whole equal thing didn't work out that way. Bipartisan bashing. This is Hillary Clinton. You may have heard of her. I find it inconceivable that a sitting president of the United States would lie to me. I'm guessing that's first. La that's not First Lady Hillary Clinton. That's Senator Hillary Clinton. Uh, and she also said, "Too many of our young people think work is a four-letter word." <laughs> it's got to be a gene, something in the water in D.C. I would like to pick on the Democrats more. It's just hard. It is. You can't mock a vacuum. <laughs> It's like trying to staple smoke. Can't even accuse the Democrats of being afraid of their own shadow. At this point, they don't cast one. One of the guiltiest pleasures in town is the new musical Xanadu, which is based on the 1980 film which starred Olivia Newton-John and Gene Kelly. It flopped at the box office, but the soundtrack, which featured songs by ELO, went double platinum. Well, now this new stage version, which features a book by Douglas Carter Bean and direction by Christopher Ashley, has opened to great reviews at the Helen Hayes Theater. Now, during previews, they lost their leading man, James Carpinello, to a skating accident, but he was replaced by Cheyenne Jackson. Joining him is Kerry Butler as Kira and Tony Roberts as Danny McGuire. We caught up with the entire company and Olivia Newton-John at Xanadu's opening night celebration. was always good and was always ahead of its time and um, to see it sent up like that and it deserved it I mean the funny thing the leg warmers and the whole thing I loved it it was brilliant now it's become a cult movie why do you think it is I don't know I think that it's camp you know and, and then the dialogue is bad and uh, and the story is hysterical when you think they're gonna do it all in like a day so I mean they took all those elements and and made fun of it as rightly so but the music was always wonderful. John Farrow's music, Jeff Lynne's music, the choreography, Kenny Ortega was years ahead of his time. The stuff he was doing, the break stuff, is like in now. This is, you know, 25 years ago or 30 or whatever it was. So um, it was a great it was great fun to do. Yeah. And talk about this wonderful cast you saw tonight, particularly Carrie Butler. Oh, she was wonderful. I was so impressed with her. She even got my... Well, the accent was hysterical. The way she jumped from American to Australian to Southern to... And she even got my body language, my awkwardness and stuff. And I told her, I was so impressed with her. She's very clever. She's a great singer. She's got great pitch. Um, she's terribly funny. And Sunny was great. All, the cast was first class. Yeah. Well, I passed a lot because I, I kept, you know, I, kept, I couldn't get through the movie. Um, and then, like, the last time I looked at it, I saw the credits going by and they had muses. And I went, oh, this could be, I would want to do something with ancient Greece and... Kind of like, you know, uh, I Married an Angel or One Touch of Venus, kind of old 30s, gla you know, sassy, sassy movies. And uh, those 30s kind of sassy musicals. And so I, I, I started working on it. And first it was really political and angry. This all has only happened, like, the first reading was 
a year ago last February. This was all very fast. I mean, you know, it sounds like we've been working on it forever. It just feels that way. But it's actually, in terms of musicals, it was really fast. Because we only had the rights for so long. We had to go, go, go. Or Universal would take them back. I get to play a great role and the audience loves it. What more could you want? And talk about your fellow muse you get to spar with eight times a week, Mary Testa. Oh, Mary Testa. She's keeping me on my toes, that one. You know, you can't steal anything with Mary Testa around. Tell me what the best part of this experience has been for you with working on this show and doing it. Wow, I think um, I think getting to do Douglas's script and getting to do such an incredibly Which is funny really show. Actor proof Douglas's script. <laughs> That's right. I'm an actor and I can prove it. We've had some accidents and stuff like that, but it's been a wonderful experience. A great cast, great director, great creative team. It's been a great room to work in, and the audiences have been loving the show. And so, you know, what's bad about that? What's been the best part of the experience for you? I've had a great time working with Jackie. We've had a ball together. It comes down to that, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and the whole cast. I mean, the whole cast is great. It's really wonderful. Um, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, James Carpinello, who we all loved and uh, we created this role with, broke his foot and his leg. Um, and that was really hard. And Cheyenne kind of was our hero and stepped in, um, went on stage with, I think we had three days of rehearsal before he was on stage in front of an audience. Um, and uh, we both really missed James and be really grateful for Cheyenne. Um, it ended up having the longest preview period uh, in <laughs> modern memory. I think not since Sarah Vaugh has a show had as many previews as this one did. Uh, but uh, it was also really kind of joyous. I love this cast. They've been fantastic fun to work with and had a great spirit all the way through. And um, I had a good time. I did two workshops of it. Um, I guess like in January and maybe March or something. I don't remember. Um, ben Breen did one and then, of course, Tony. I got nine stitches in my hand, throwing myself against the mural at one point. Long history with Xanadu. So then uh, they asked me to do um, the Broadway production. Jane's show had gotten picked up, 30 Rock, and I was finishing a movie, and I thought, I don't know if I can do it without her. Because it was so, my whole performance was based on, you know, our relationship. and um, So I, I, I took a pass on that on doing it uh, on Broadway but I kind of I told my mom the other day I had a feeling that it might come back to me in some way I don't know it's Xanadu so uh, about three weeks ago I get a call I was just I just got done with the performance of Superman I was exhausted and Chris called me and Chris is I don't know if you know Chris Ashley very well but he's not very emotional so when he calls and he says you can hear something in his voice I'm like oh shit he said James broke his leg and his foot in three places we're screwed. Is there any way? And my heart kind of sank a little bit. And then I thought, hmm, there may be something here. It may be something to talk about, at least. Um, but I couldn't picture anybody else than the, in the part than Jane. Even though I love Carrie and seen her in things, I thought, I can't picture her. So I had, a, a, you know, and she knows all this. I went and talked to Chris, and he said, uh, watch her. Watch her in it. And I did, and she rocked it. Totally different from Jane, but totally, completely, 100% her own, and successful, and strong choices, and she's real, and she's... So I thought, okay, I can do this. I would have to say um, the audience's response. Because, you know, with Xanadu, you don't know how it's going to go, and just 
it's just like this huge party and the audience has been amazing. So I think that's been the best thing. And what's it like playing this theater? I love the size of this house. Yeah, it's great. I mean, who would have thought? It seems so small, but then, uh, you know, they made they, they, the work that they did with it, it, it now it looks big. But it's just so intimate too. At the very yeah, same yeah, yeah. time, is it is no, a nice house? Yeah, is it a nice house to play? Because you get to see a lot of the audience down front too, right? Oh yeah, I see everybody, and so it's really fun. I mean, a lot of times I try not to look because I don't want it to throw me. But I saw where Olivia Newton John was sitting today, and then I was like, don't look, don't look. Now you've had two leading men. Of course, you've had James first, and now you have Cheyenne. Yeah. Talk about both of your leading men. Well, um, they are both amazing, and I am the luckiest girl in the world because. You know, I, I loved James. We have this great relationship and great chemistry on stage. And so when he hurt his leg, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, you know, you get nervous because you don't want somebody mean coming in. That's my, That was my main thing. I was like, I just want somebody nice. And luckily, like, Cheyenne couldn't be nicer and so gracious to James. And it's just like, you know, we're a great family. And it's interesting because you saw both of them, right? And it's like apples and oranges. They're, they're completely different, but equally great. Whenever you're away from me, wherever you go, you're never far away from me. I want you to know, I only have to close my eyes, dear, and suddenly I'm where you are. You better never stray, cause I'll never be far away. You know, Danny McGuire is the role that Gene Kelly played. And the nice thing is I get to play him as an old curmudgeon, and I get to play him as a young guy full of ideals. And uh, it isn't often that you get to go that complete span. And then to play God, and not just off stage. I mean, it's great. <laughs> We're at the Julia Miles Theater for the kickoff of the 2007 New York Musical Theater Festival, also known as NIMF. Now in its fourth year, this three-week event will take place from September 17th until October 7th at various theaters around the city, featuring over 34 new musicals written by some of today's brightest new talents. You know, the off-Broadway musical Altar Boys, which continues packing them in at New World Stages, got their start here at NIMF. Here's a sampling of this season's offerings. Says Sympathy Jones, super secret agent. She conquers disaster in the flash of an eye. Sympathy Jones, super secret agent. She's a dangerous woman. Spy, if your point of view is criminal, Miss Jones will correct it. She's like a message so subliminal. You'd never suspect it. Well, I think that, first of all, the music's great. And for me, that's always the thing that clicks in first. If I love the music, if I can feel it in my voice. I, I also like that it's it's music for a female character written by women. Because I've sung a lot of, no offense, I've sung a lot of songs composed by guys in the last few years. And they all top out at the same screamy part of your voice. And it's kind of nice to sing music that was written by women who sort of have a different appreciation for the ups and downs and why it's okay to use the low part of your voice once in a while, you know. Um, and the other thing I like like about it is that although I love doing Legally Blonde, I'm having a blast, the show is great, this is the complete opposite in terms of character. Um, she's guileless, she's, you know, hopeful, she's optimistic and innocent, and I think that that's a really pretty fun thing to do in my off time. <laughs> a link you can Well, we are doing a show called Such Good Friends, and it's about three friends that uh, got started in the early days of television. It's kind of a, an I Love Lucy show, Carol Burnett kind of thing. And then the Hollywood blacklist happens, and it turns into kind of a morality play and what to do about that, right? Exactly. McCarthy, always fun material. Yeah, yeah, it is. It it's a great. It's a, fun. It's yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating time in our history, and here's a, a musical comedy, basically about three people. And so the show is not about the Red Scare or the McCarthy area, but it is about how it did affect these three friends. Don't screw around with Martha. Nah, you yeah, don't screw around with me. You wanna get in a fight? 
I'll lick you all night. That would suit me to a T. It's a very simple concept I'm trying to convey. If you want to stay alive, you'll do things my way. I'm Martha the Monster, and they called me up and said, you're perfect for the Martha the Monster. You're perfect. I'm like, is this a, com- is this a compliment? So, but she's the um, she's the, the the captain of the bad guy team and roller derby. You know they always. I mean, we've all watched roller derby. I think I grew up with it, loved it. Um, all of us white trash people. So uh, I'm the captain of the bad team, the demons. So what you hear is all, I do all these dirty tricks and all the mean stuff. But I'm fun. I am fun. The, in the beginnings, it was more just, let's just see what happens. Let's fly it and see what goes on. But with each year, we've kind of felt a bit more consolidated, a bit more like an organisation. We've sort of spread the, the, the network of what we're doing, and now it feels like we're a bit grown up, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a... a f- I mean, it's been a long year for us because we've expanded into the year to try to really support these artists in a way so that it wasn't just about doing three weeks of shows, but really about providing a platform and a a network for these artists and finding the best way to promote them and to push them up into the spotlight that New York City can provide. And uh, I think we've done a... I'm really looking forward to this year's festival because the the teams that have assembled around these shows is just incredible. And this was a musical that um, I just had a real strong emotional and creative response to. It's a very theatrical kind of uh, musical. The music is very eclectic and wonderful, and it's really about something. And uh, about individuality, about growing up, about... um, loving yourself, a lot of things that are kind of corny in a lot of musical theater shows, but in this show in particular, I, I really uh, believe in it. And I've just had a great experience, and we're in the middle of rehearsal now, I, I've had a great experience with a wonderful uh, pr- production team and, um, and uh, the composer and lyricist and book writer. Really a, f- a fun way to, uh, to work in the theater is to create something from the ground up like this, and so I've, I've just had a great time. This is my life. I'm not gonna fight this urge to 